Welcome to Grace today. We're so glad to have you. And I hope you got your little booklet today. <laughs> uh, we were in the book of 1 Kings. And uh, as I was going through the book of 1 Kings, uh, the last chapter I did, the next chapter I knew that Solomon was going to die. And I was thinking, well, you know, we, we only got so much time with Solomon. I wanted us to go and find out the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say. What's the rest of the story with Solomon? And so we find out the rest of the story in Ecclesiastes. Actually, uh, I think you're going to find it very interesting at the life that Solomon had and, uh, and then what, his, what the end result was. Today I want to talk about the subject here. What is the point of life? If I can see it across there. What is the point of life? Um, I guess you could say it comes with a job. One of the things that uh, I do as a minister quite often is I do funerals, I do weddings and funerals. I'd actually rather do a funeral than a wedding. <laughs> I'm just saying that. But uh, uh, And, you know, some people wonder about, going to a funeral, kids going to a funeral. I think it's actually good for us to go to a funeral. Uh, Solomon actually says in Ecclesiastes one place that you're better off to go into the, to, uh, the house of grieving than you are to go to a party. Now, some of you like a party, but he says it's actually you gain more from going to a house of grieving. And uh, we'll find out why Solomon began to have some of these opinions about life. Uh, but the other thing is, what do we gain from our work and our toil and our strife? That's one thing Solomon is wanting to find out. What's the point of life? What's the point of life? And what do we have to gain? The book of Ecclesiastes, if you look up here on the side walls, I don't know if you can see it. We had it there. If you were to take the first part of that word there and replace the two C's with two K's, the first part of that would be, uh, ecclesia, and in the New Testament, in the Greek, ecclesia means church, and the word church means the called out ones that were called out. Uh, we could have been a part of a, a community, and we're called out because we have a, a different view, a different purpose in life, the called out ones. Well, uh, so the ecclesia, uh, Ecclesiastes, the astes on the end means teacher or preacher. A lot of times King James Version will say preacher. Some of your Bibles will say teacher. And so the, the uh, Ecclesiastes means the called out ones, and they have a teacher or a preacher. Solomon was that teacher or that preacher in his time. People would come to hear him because he was a very, very, very wise man. And so he is writing this uh, from the perspective of, uh, of looking back. I want us to go to our little booklets. We've got, we'll put it up here on the Sky Bible here where you can see as we go. We're going to read through this first chapter here. It said, the words of the preacher the son of David, the king of Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. What does a man gain by all the toll at which he tolls under the sun? A generation goes and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it arises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north, around and around goes the wind, and on its uh, circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness a man cannot utter. So far it sounds very happy story, right? <laughs> He says, I is not satisfied with seeing, and nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. 
Is there a thing of which it is said, see, look, this is new. It, it has al- it's been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of the former things, nor will there be any remembrance of latter things yet to be among those who come after. Then he says, I, the preacher, have been king over Israel and Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity, a striving after the wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight, and what is lacking cannot be counted. I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me. And my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to know wisdom and to know madness and folly. I perceive that this also is but a striving after the wind. He says, for in much wisdom is much uh, vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. I'd like to pray over this word. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray that you would take the words and the meditations of our heart. God, that it would go deep into our, our thinking, Lord, deep into our heart, that we would listen to what Solomon has to say, and even more so, we'd listen to what the Holy Spirit has to say to us in this service. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <clears throat> this uh, book of Ecclesiastes tackles some of the hard issues about life. Uh, Solomon wrote from the perspective of an older man who was looking back at his life, kind of looking at life through a rearview mirror. Throughout the book, we read about the, his feelings, we read about his disappointments, his frustrations, and his regrets. Solomon became jaded and cynical in his later years due to a uh, to the number of bad choices that he made over the courses of his life. The book is not just a depressing journal of an old king. It is a reminder that someone like Solomon can have everything in life. He had money, he had fame, he had power, he had success and relationships, and still he was not satisfied because God wasn't in the equation of his life. And to, today, uh, as we look back, on the little bit of the history of this message, we, we find, well, who is the writer? Well, we know right away from Ecclesiastes 1 and 1 that the son of David is king of Israel. He said uh, that in the very first verse that the writer, and so David had many sons, but he only had one that was the king of Israel, and that was Solomon. And so Solomon wrote the book. Most people believe that Solomon, you know, he also wrote... Uh, we know that he wrote Proverbs and he wrote the Song of Solomon. Uh, we may go through the little booklet here on the Song of Solomon. If we do, it'll be PG, Parents' Guidance. <laughs> He's very explicit about what he knows about women. Uh, he describes stuff in great detail. I think he may have done that when he was younger. They say, you know, when you're younger, all you think about is sex. Well, <clears throat> you know, it could be true. He wrote a very descriptive book about women. And uh, evidently, he liked women very well. Then we get to uh, Proverbs. And some people, they say, well, Proverbs was written first. I I don't know, Song Song of Solomon, then he wrote Proverbs. Proverbs, he's telling, you know, son, incline your ear to do this and incline your ear to do that. And, you know, listen to what I'm telling you. Uh, You know, I know I'm your dad, you know. But we, we find out that from reading the book of Proverbs that, you know, and even from reading about the rest of Kings there, we realize that Solomon, he, he did not have a, a, he was not a great example to his children. And his children, they say whatever one person does in moderation in, in one generation, it'll be done in excess into the next generation. That was so true among Solomon. The, the, the vices he had were even worse among his children. And so it's kind of like in Proverbs, he's saying, son, 
do as I say, not as I do. How many knows that does not work in parenting at all? It does not work. If you're trying it, you might as well give up. It does not work. And so uh, we realize that, uh, that here he, he's, he's now an older man. Now, most scholars believe that he was 16 or 17 years of age when he became king of Israel. Uh, Josephus, a first century historian, said that he actually thought that he become king at 14 or 15 years of age. Uh, how many would, most of you don't even want your kid driving your car at 15, 14 or 15 or 16 or 17 years of age. He's running a kingdom. You know, he's, he's in tr tr uh, control of a kingdom. And in the very beginning, he, I think he tried to lean on the wisdom, the things he saw from his father, David. And I think he tried to lean upon the Lord early on. Um, but now in this book of Ecclesiastes, he appears to be a man. We know that he ruled as a king for 40 years. So if, let's just break the difference. It says if he was 15 when he was king of Israel. If you add 40 years to that, then uh, Solomon is probably 55 years of age. Uh, how many thinks 55 is an old man? <laughs> I do not like that part of this story at all. But they, it appears that he is like an old man that is looking back at his life and he has a lot of regrets. Um, we know that he, uh, he was a man that tried to experience everything that he could possibly experience. The, the book tells us, you know, some people think that he was just venting. He was how angry and mad about and frustrated about life, and he was just venting. Other believes that this whole book of, of, of Ecclesiastes is almost like a, a storybook of repentance. But he does not give you the real answer until the end. He tells you, I tried this, and I tried that, and I tried this, and I tried this. And it was all, the word vanity is, is translated many places, meaning, meaningless. It's all meaningless. There's no real, you know, there's no real joy to it. Uh, Ecclesiastes, when he gets to the end, he, he he's kind of tells you the answer. Uh, here's what I discovered, but I'm going to tell you a hundred ways life does not work. And in Ecclesiastes 12, 9 through 14, he said, not only was the teacher wise, talking about himself, but also he impacted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. The teacher searched to find just the right words, and what he wrote was upright and true. The words of the wise are like goads. They're collected sayings like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them, talking about God's word, of making many books there is no end, and so much study wearies the body. Now all, all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. So here's his conclusion. Here's the, the, the one uh, line at the end of the book of Ecclesiastes. That's why I believe it's his, it's his uh, looking back in a rearview mirror about all the bad things he's done in life, like a deathbed confession. He looks back and he said, believe me, I tried it all. But here's my conclusion in life. He said, fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. Solomon, Solomon was, is brutally honest in the book of Ecclesiastes. And uh, I, th I think that's kind of what amazes me. He's brutally honest about how frustrated he is with life. Even though he experienced everything to the fullest, he was just laying it all out there. Solomon, he didn't have a question as to whether God existed. See, Solomon was not an atheist. Solomon's greater question was whether God matters. Does God matter? I wonder today if, 
if that could be some of our question, does God matter? To going to church matter? To believing in God matter? People ask this question. If life, you know, life is kind of unpredictable, you know, and some people say, well, just eat, drink, and be merry because one day we die. Is that all there is? Is that all the purpose there is in life? But he uses this, this word, uh, vanities, or it's, it's translated meaningless. Uh, in King James Version, it's, it's vanity. He uses it 38 times in the book. Meaningless. Life is meaningless. Meaningless. The Hebrew word for meaningless, vanity, is hevel, which means it's like a vapor. It's like smoke. It's like a mist. It, it, you know, it's here for a moment, and then it's gone. It's like chasing after the wind. And so it's important to understand that the word doesn't mean just that it has no meaning. It just means it, it's fleeting. It's unsatisfactory. Uh, you, you can't find satisfaction in this world. All the stuff that he did... So if we go back, and those that have been following us here, we know back, we go back in Solomon, how he come into this place in life. Around 900 B.C., he was about 16 or 17 years old, as we stated. And the Lord appeared to Solomon, and he asked for whatever you want me to give you. And Solomon asked for wisdom and discernment or understanding. And, and the Lord not only gave him wisdom, he also gave Solomon riches and long life and death to, uh, to his enemies. He didn't ask for, he said, since you didn't ask for a long life, since you didn't ask for riches, since you di didn't ask for the death of your, riches, your enemies, I'm going to give that to you anyway. Have you ever thought about for a moment if somebody come up to you today that had the ability to do anything that you wanted, if they come up to you and said, hey, you've got one wish, what would it be? And I'm not talking about the uh, beauty pageant. I want world peace for everyone. And <laughs> hell, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about if you had a one wish today, if you could just have one wish and one wish only, what would it be? What would it be? Think about that for a moment. It reminds me of an old couple, 60 years old. That's not old either, but I heard a story about a, Old couple, they were walking on the beach, and as they was walking on the beach, they hit something, and they looked down, and it was a bottle there laying in the sand. And they picked it up, and they brushed it off, had a little cork in it, and they pulled the cork out, and this Jenny come out of the bottle. That's a true story. And, <laughs> and this Jenny come out of the bottle, and the Jenny said, hey, you, you, you've, you got me out of the bottle, so each one of you gets one wish. One wish, and we'll start with your wife. And she said, oh, one way she said, well, since we're on this beautiful, gorgeous, you know, this island, I want to be just be on a deserted island for the rest of my life with just me and my hubby. That's what I want more than anything else in the world. Poof, there they were in this beautiful, gorgeous, deserted island, you know, just him, her and her hubby. And he said, well, sir, now what would you like for your wish? And he said, well, let me think. Well, since we're going to be here forever and it's just me and my wife, I would like for my wife to be 30 years younger. <laughs> and poof, he turned 90 years old just like that. <laughs> <laughs> so you need to be careful what you ask for. You, do, you need to be really careful what you ask for. And so we, we find Solomon, and, and Jeff done such a good job as he was finishing up our part with uh, 1 Kings. 1 Kings 3 and 1, Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married his daughter. Now we're going, well, where did Solomon get to the point that he hated life, he was frustrated life, he didn't want to live life anymore? What happened to him? Well, we know that he went, and one of the first really bad things he did, he went and he married Pharaoh, uh, the king Pharaoh's daughter. 
in making this alliance, he demonstrated that he didn't fully have confidence and trust in the Lord. He married a woman who was a pagan worshiper. You know, he felt like when you build these alliances, then that kingdom there will not attack you. And, you know, it may have had some merit because he did not have any war for the 40 years that he was uh, king of Israel. Unfortunately, he made alliances with many other nations, and part of these deals required him to marry the daughters of the kings of these neighboring nations. So the king goes, I'm going to give you my daughter, but I want to come into this alliance. We'll do trade deals and all these. And we find this in 1 Kings 11, 1 through 6. King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter. He, he married Moabites and Ammonites and Edomites and Termites and uh, Sidonians and Hittites and anyway they were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites you must not the, the Lord said you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods nevertheless Solomon held fast to them in love he had 700 wives of royal birth and 300 concubines and his wives led him astray as Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father had been. And so there was the beginning. God said, do not do this, and they did it. he did it anyway. Instead of trusting a God that delivered them from Egypt's bondage without tanks and weapons, where they were deftly outnumbered, God delivered them from Pharaoh's bondage. Now he's going back and he's visiting and he's taking these women and their false religion and bringing them into the people of God. And Solomon kept doing this. You know, you wonder why he died at like 55 years of age. 700 wives? Maybe that's a clue. You reckon he ever, hey, does this tunic make me look fat? <laughs> I wonder how many times you've heard that. Solomon, Solomon, I think you like her more than you do me. I think you like her a lot more than me. I saw you looking at her the other day. And, you know, I can see all these women in front of their mirror, you know, mirror, mirror on the wall, who's the most beautiful of them all. But, I mean, he had to entertain all of this and, uh, Pretty soon he started just building them. You know, he, we, we know from the story that he got his priorities out of order because he spent seven years uh, building the temple, but he, he spent like 14, 15 years building his own house. And then with the house as gigantic as you read in 1 Kings, you find out that he also, he goes over here and he starts building these women a house, okay? You're so great, I'm going to build you your own house, I'm going to build you a house and you a house and you a house. Because I can't take it no more. Was he the one that said you'd be better off in a little old hut with a tin leaking roof than with a woman that's mad at you? <laughs> he knew a lot. He knew all the things about women that you probably don't want to know. But if you think of what all he had. And I, I know a lot of people go, man, he had 300 girlfriends, 700 wives. Man, that's good. I, I don't know what the problem is there. Well, Solomon's saying, I experienced that. And I can tell you, that's not where you're going to find real joy in life. A lot of times when you look at priorities, one guy said one time, you can really learn a lot about somebody's priorities in life by looking at their calendar and looking at their checkbook. Do you have God in your calendar? Have you marked off some days of the month for God? Do you still feel like church is important? Do you feel like giving to God is still important? Well, we find out that Solomon, uh, he gets kind of led astray. Solomon starts off, and he's, he's all about God, and he's trying to please God, and he asked the right questions, you know, in the beginning. But before it was over, there's only 222 verses in the book of Solomon, Ecclesiastes. 
222 verses, but 87 times he uses the personal pronoun I. I, I, I. You know, when the devil was cast out of heaven, Lucifer, he said, I will exalt myself. I, I, I. When you look at Paul in Romans 7, Romans 7, he uses a personal pronoun I 32 times in the seventh chapter. And that's when he was killing Christians. And he was, and, and Paul was, saw at that time, he's saying, the things I don't want to do, that's what I end up doing. And the things that I do want to do, that's what I don't do. And he uses the personal pronoun I 32 times. And at the end of the seventh chapter, he said, Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? And then we, he realized that Jesus Christ was the answer. You get over to the eighth chapter. He said, There is now no more condemnation of those that walk not after the flesh, but walk after the spirit. So what Paul is saying that if you walk after the flesh is not very fulfilling. Solomon is saying walking after the flesh and being all about me and my and I is not very fulfilling. And so you realize that he, he not only had all these women, but he had great wealth. We read in 1 Kings 10, 21, all King Solomon's goblets were gold and all the household's articles in the palace at the forest of Lebanon were pure gold. Nothing was made of silver because silver was considered of little value to Solomon in those days. The king had a fleet of trading ships at sea along with ships of Hiram. Once every three years he returned carrying gold and silver and ivory and apes and baboons, you know. You never can tell when you don't need an ape or a baboon around the house, you know. He probably didn't even know what they were. You know, bring me back some little monkeys and bring me back one of them big old monkeys, you know. It's a true story. My son, and he was taking the, my grandkids to school, and uh, they were at a red light, and a man sitting in a truck, there's a monkey sitting on his lap looking out the window. My kids go, look, Dad, the man's got a monkey in his truck, <laughs> My son said, son, don't be, don't be joking around like that. He said, look, Daddy. And so he grabbed the phone. He took a picture of it. He, there is a guy in Knoxville got a monkey in his truck. It's true. But you think about all the things that Solomon had. And I'd like for the team to get ready, if you will. All the things that Solomon had. He had all this gold. He had apes and baboons. He had women. King Solomon was greater in riches and wisdom than all the other kings of the earth. And yet, the story that we read about Solomon is, he's saying, I can't get no satisfaction. I can't get no satisfaction. Because I tried and I tried and I tried and I can't get no satisfaction. Now, I think that was from the prophet Jagger. <laughs> it's still true, though. He's telling a story, and he, he says, uses under the sun. I think it's 59 times. He's telling you his experience, all these the first 11 chapters, he's telling you of his experience under the sun. And under the sun, there's no satisfaction. You live your whole life, and one day you're going to realize it's just all over. I want to end with a few things here, three points. Time is slipping away. I like there was some time keeps on slipping, slipping, slipping into the future. The great eagles. Ecclesiastes 1, 4, and 6 says, Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises, the sun sets, and hurries back to where it rises. And the wind blows to the south and turns to the north. Round and around it goes, ever returning on its course. Life is mundane. It becomes boring. There's a lot of life that is completely out of our control is another thing when you're talking about weather patterns. It's amazing people that get flooded out and they'll build a house in the same spot. They'll build it a little higher. Then they get flooded out again. Here's the thing that we don't like to really embrace is there is a lot of things in this life out of our control. 
but we still try to control it. And when we try to control the uncontrollable, it only makes us frustrated because we can't control things. And we never have and we never will. This world is out of control and we can't control it. And it makes us frustrated. We can't change the past. We can't predict the future. But that's all the more reason why we need God in our lives. Because we can give our past to God and we can trust Him with our future. The next thing we learn is there's nothing really new at all. He tells us here what has been will be again and what has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new. It was here already, long ago. It was here before our time. Our granddaughter, she's fixing to graduate. You know, she's in her senior year. It's amazing to watch them dress up for certain things of school. And like, and like whatever she's wearing, you know, it may be bell bottoms. And like, look, I'm my new out my new jeans. I go, baby, that ain't new. <laughs> I, I've, I've, got, I've had a pair of them. That ain't new. See, whatever you got, hold on to it. It'll come back in style eventually. And people will make you think it's new. But it's not new. It's been here a long time. The other thing that when we think about the things that are new, the third thing is no one will be remembered. This is one of the things that bothered Solomon the most. All that he'd done, 40 years of peace, he, he, there's never a time to this day that there has ever been the prosperity, the, uh, the, uh, the, they had the most freedom, they had the most land, they had the most prestige. There's never been a time in Israel since then when Solomon lived. And yet he realized one day he will not be remembered. How many knows the name James Sherman? Thomas Hendricks. Charles Arthur. Chester Arthur. These were guys that they spent an incredible amount of time becoming what they were. And y'all don't even know who they are. Maybe a few. These were vice presidents of the United States. And I know it's getting to be common right now. We want to forget some. <laughs> There's a few presidents I'd love to forget. <laughs> but the point is made. Can anybody remember who won the Super Bowl last year? What about five years ago? Who won the gold in the Olympics? And some of these people work their entire life and you don't even care? James Dobson said he'd, he'd won a, a big tennis trophy at his high school and they won the championship and they had the trophy in the school and somebody wrote to him and said, uh, I found this in the trash and it had your name on there and I knew your name and I wanted to make sure you had it. They, they cleaned out the trophy saying yours was one thrown out. So it is true. James 4, 14 says, why do you not even know what will happen? We don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? It's a midst, it appears for a little while and then it vanishes. Now, for those of you who know Christ, we know there is an eternal life past this eternal existence. That's the only thing that when I do a funeral, you know, I, I love when somebody, I usually try to get the family to get up and tell all they can about that person. Stuff that I would not even know and it makes it so beautiful. But it, when it's my time to say something at a funeral, what I want you to know is where your loved one is at that moment and at that time. And the Bible says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And see, to know Christ, we know that there's an eternal life past this earthly existence. But what James was saying was, you're here today and you're gone tomorrow. There is a very short window of time called life. And the question becomes, 
that all of us must answer is, where does God fit into the short thing that's been called life? Where does God fit into this short little period of time that we call life? How is his relationship with me going to give me the right perspective and purpose and meaning for my life that without him I would not have? An old song we used to sing in church, without him I would be nothing. Without him I'd be like a ship without a sail. If you hang out around Grace here very much, you're going to find out we talk a lot about Jesus. We talk a lot about Jesus. Because that's all that really, really matters. That's all that... If Jesus wouldn't have come... Solomon's talking about all that happened under the sun. All that happened under in this life, in this world. Paul, even Paul said, in this life, if that's all you've got to hope for is this life, then you're going to be a person that is most miserable. You know, there's a lot of miserable people in this world today because they don't honor Christ. They don't put him first in their life. They don't have him on their calendar. They don't have him in their checkbook. They do not love God and follow after God and seek God. It's not, you know, what is, what is a Christian? It's a Christ follower. It's not just the one time you shake somebody's preacher's hand and say, you know, a few words. It, you become a Christ follower, that Christ becomes important every day in your life.